For centuries, popes have had not one but two roles. They've had to wrestle with how to lead a spiritual institution in a physical and highly political world, a situation that has involved the Vatican in a number of wars over the centuries and was especially challenging during Hitler's rise to power. Pope Pius XII had to decide whether the spiritual role he played would take precedence over the political or vice versa during some of the bloodiest years in history, and he's been accused of being neutral in the face of Nazi atrocities. But in a book called Church of Spies, The Pope's Secret War Against Hitler, Mark Riebling writes that Pius was not a bystander and was actually very active in challenging Hitler, even planning to kill him by using cover operatives and also by surreptitiously tape recording his meetings with top Nazis to use as evidence. Tell us a little about uh, Eugenio Pacelli, the uh, the man who became Pope Pius XII. Um, he was born in 1876 in Rome, became a cardinal by 1929, uh, then moved up the political ladder in the Vatican. Was he the obvious choice as the next pope? Well, he really was. It was the shortest conclave in about four centuries. The political crisis facing Europe at this point in March 1939 produced a political pope. So it was a, a conclave that lasted a day. And the reason Pacelli was chosen is he had four decades in the Vatican foreign service. And he'd also come to the United States. He'd been to France. So he was a, a man of the world. He was, for whatever that meant, in terms of being a Vatican diplomat, for sure. And he'd also spent 12 years in Germany as a papal agent there during the 1920s, which was a factor. But he became pope just six months before World War II began. That's right. And from the very start, he was looked at, especially in London, as a potential mediator of a peace once war broke out. And within a very short time during that fateful summer of 1939, Pius had begun secret meetings with British diplomats in order first to try and avert a war, and then by the end of the year, once war had broken out, to try and remove Hitler. On another front, you write that uh, more than any other pope that had preceded him, he was a man of science. He really was, and this is one of the things that people don't understand. I mean, you mentioned that he was born in 1876, and at that time, right around the time he was born, General Custer was about to be ambushed at Little Bighorn. When he died in 1958, a rocket was about to orbit the moon. That's quite a span, and it was one of Pacelli's jobs as Pius XII to bring this very much medieval institution into the modern world. He was educated at a liberal high school, and he felt very guilty about what the church had done with Galileo, and he wanted to kind of exercise that ghost. So, for instance, he built Vatican Radio into a worldwide broadcasting system, and he was very much, this is a surprising thing for Pope to say, but he said, and when there's a conflict, we have to go with science. His predecessor, Pope Pius XI, had made statements praising Hitler because uh, he was an anti-communist. Do we know if that's how Pius XI really felt about Hitler? He did at first, but by the time the Vatican did its deal with Hitler in July 1933, there were enough reports about the Nazis beating up Catholic workers and really trying to destroy the political apparatus of the church in Germany that they realized that this was a kind of a mistake to be in, in bed with Hitler, as it were. But they were kind of stuck. And so progressively, by 1937, Pope Pius XI issued a very harsh encyclical against what the Nazis were doing. It was probably the harshest encyclical that the church has issued against any state. But the result was increased persecution of German Catholics. And one of the lessons Pacelli took from that was that it was better work behind the scenes. Pacelli uh, negotiated a concordat with Hitler that would supply annual tax revenues of 500 million marks. What was the money for? Well, that was to support the, the church. Uh, in America, we don't realize that traditionally churches in Europe are supported by, even today in many countries, supported by tax revenues. We have a, a much sharper separation between church and state. The, the idea was, well, if you're not allowed to collect taxes from Catholics and use it to support the church, the church would fall apart. So this was an accepted thing at the time, and it's still kind of accepted over there. Before he became Pope Pius XII, he was quite vocal in his opposition to the Nazis. Um, he he made some really uh, powerful public remarks. Were the Nazis worried about him? They were very worried. And in fact, on March 4th, 1939, just a couple of days after Pacelli was elected pope, 
Josef Goebbels, the German propaganda minister, met with Hitler to decide what to do, and Hitler said, well, we're going to break off this concordat with the Vatican as soon as Pacelli undertakes his first hostile act. And Pacelli was very aware of this, Pius XII was very aware of this, and he met with the German cardinals that month, and the cardinals said to him on behalf of the German bishops, please don't speak out, please don't put us in a difficult position. But he'd already said things like, Christianity has supposedly gathered together a all the races, whether Negro or white, into a single big family of God. Hence, the Catholic Church also rejects anti-Semitism. Mm-hmm. That was the uh, official SS summary of the Pope's positions that he had taken, and really the Pope was speaking on behalf of Catholic doctrine. When people think of the Holy Office of Inquisition, it sounds like a really scary thing, and it was in certain ways, but the Inquisition had also issued a statement saying that Catholics could not be anti-Semites. Which well, they did this. persecute Jews in Spain, a ghetto in Italy, et cetera, et cetera. And, and one of the theses of my book really is that the legacy of these centuries of Christian anti-Semitism really limited the responsiveness of European Catholics to something like a papal pronunciation. But when he said something like that, how did German Catholics react? After all, they were caught in a bind. On the one hand, Hitler was their leader, and many of them supported him. On the other hand, the Pope was telling them something totally opposite. Well, I think what we saw is that by the 1930s, 1940s, German Catholics saw themselves, like people in many places, more as Germans than as Catholics. And indeed, this was what was largely desired of them, that they saw themselves first as citizens of the nation. It became more complicated then when you have a universal moral authority asking them to do something that would be against the laws of their nation. But then when he became pope, did he have to become more discreet about this? Well, he was always a really discreet guy, but certainly... His view of the papacy was that his job was to keep Catholics from going off the cliff into internal damnation. So he wanted them to stay in the church, be taking the sacraments. And his biggest fear was that there was going to be a schism that would have left German Catholics basically a, in a heretical position. So he, did, he wanted to avoid that. My guess is Mark Riebling. It's Riebling, right? It is. Uh, his book, Church of Spies, The Pope's Secret War Against Hitler, it's published by Basic Books. This is WNYC, WNYC.org. I'm Leonard Lopate. Uh, you mentioned the uh, profile that uh, a German wrote about him. It was written by a defrocked priest, storm leader Albert Hartel. Hartel, yes. He was uh, someone who had joined the priesthood to please his pious mother, but was quickly sort of shunted out because the church decided he had a problem dealing with girls. Uh, He joined the SS and led a team of former priests who were involved in targeting priests, uh, sexually blackmailing them, getting them for currency exchange violations, allegedly, and blackmailing these priests into trying to cooperate with the SS to get information. And what did he, what was his profile uh, of the Pope? Uh, Because this is, uh, he wrote the profile the day Pacelli became Pope Pius XII. Well, he saw Pacelli as a behind-the-scenes, very skilled and gifted diplomat, someone who would not be a ranting mystic, but rather a shrewd perceiver of events that maybe other people missed. And he definitely was expecting the uh, the Pope to wage a secret war against Germany, and in fact, the Pope did. And Germany also was perceived as perhaps leading a war against the Catholic Church. Munich's Cardinal Michael von Fallheiber was concerned that Hitler was going to break the German Catholic Church away from Rome. And he wrote, Catholics admire Herr Hitler as a hero despite his hatred of the church. That's right. Was Hitler actually making those kinds of plans? He certainly was. And if you just jump ahead a little bit, I mean, during the war, uh, Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, had this elaborate plan, which almost uh, was mounted, to invade the Vatican, kidnap the Pope, take him back to Germany, and have him executed to celebrate the opening of a new soccer stadium in Berlin. And what we know from the Pope's tapes that he made in his library was that the German cardinals said to him, we're very afraid that if you call out German Catholics and demand too much of them, that they'll follow Hitler instead of Rome. And uh, Fall Haber wanted to have a meeting with the Pope and some other cardinals, but uh, there was concern that there might be a, a possible spy among them? There, certainly there was an Austrian cardinal who's, who's, who had actually came out, come out when Hitler did the Anschluss in Austria in 1938 and said the church supports Hitler. And this fellow was then called to Rome by Pacelli and dressed down and had to retract his words. But because he was among the, the four cardinals, German-speaking cardinals, who came to visit the 
the Vatican in 1939. Pacelli wanted some record, verbatim record, of what was said. And based on that, he had, the, uh, he had his own Jesuit technicians bug the audiences. An audio surveillance system? <laughs> this is 1939. What kind of equipment was available then? Well, the Vatican had the good fortune to be hardwired by the inventor of the radio, uh, Marconi. And so they had quite state-of-the-art surveillance systems. They had a huge wire tape recorder, and they had connected this. Technicians had connected this with concealed microphones. And so this was just as audio surveillance was coming into its own, and the Vatican was a pioneer of this kind of thing. And put it together in 24 hours. They did. It was an elaborate operation using um, tools and drills and, and all kinds of things in the middle of the night in the Vatican. Weren't the, those secret recordings uh, among the most well-guarded in the Vatican, why weren't they made public? Because over the years, Pope Pius XII has been accused of actually uh, being perhaps sympathetic to the Nazi cause. Well, it's one of those things of hiding in plain sight and being untranslated. The transcripts were in German. They were published in an appendix to a series of documents that were published in the 1960s. But the reference to these transcripts was omitted in the table of contents. So remarkably, everyone missed them for about 50 years. And it wasn't until I asked a Vatican priest who was in charge of Pacelli's sainthood proceedings, I said, well, where did these ver verbatim tapes come from, that I was able to pick, pick the lock on the story, as it were, and realize that they were um, transcripts of um, surveillance recordings. So you're the first person to actually write about them? I am. And what did you find in them that came as a real surprise? I think the thing that most sur surprised me, Leonard, was to see how these German clerics relaxed after a week in Italy and almost bantered as if in a kind of clerical locker room. They joked about their own prospects for sainthood, and they even joked about how the Pope should address Hitler, whether they, you know, they said in one case, the Holy Father also says, Heil, Heil. And this is a different kind of clerical personality than we often uh, see in public, certainly. In that meeting, Cardinal Fallhaber tells the Pope about the rise in violence against Catholics and of a speech that Hitler had given to the Reichstag, in which he said, the priest as political enemy of the Germans we shall destroy. Brown shirts, beheading cathedral statues, uh, using crucifixes for target practice, smearing altars with excrement. Uh, what did he recommend that the Pope do? Cardinal Fahaber certainly wanted the Pope to avoid any kind of contentious public statements which could get into a war of words with the Nazis. Instead, he believed in using backstairs contacts, a kind of mechanism I would term secret, sacred social networks, uh, intervene behind the scenes, avoid putting Catholics in a difficult position, and work with the power structures that were in place in Germany to try and move Hitler. Overt acquiescence, but covert countering of Nazism. That's right, and this is very much the signature of how the Vatican has worked for centuries in European politics. It's the place you could go to if you wanted to change a regime and you wanted to talk to exiles. The Vatican was always a kind of willing interlocutor for people willing to do these things. Now, strictly speaking, the Catholic Church didn't have a Vatican intelligence service, but it did have agents of a type. Hadn't uh, You write that Cardinal Pacelli had actually been a spy 38 years before he was... Uh, named the Pope. What was he spying for? Well, Pacelli's spy work really began right before he went to Germany, uh, during the earliest years of World War One, where there were German agents coming to Rome and trying to get various papal positions which would support Germany in the war. And so you had Pacelli meeting in back alleys and in crypts and in confessionals with uh, Matthias Erzberger, the leader of the German Catholic Center Party. Over time, Erzberger became very pacifistic with regard to Germany in the war, and Pacelli began conspiring with Erzberger to have the German government try and stand down the war effort and make peace with the Allies. So this was the sort of prefigurement, if you will, of what Pacelli did during World War II. How did they pass secret information from one to the other? Well, one of the great things about being a Catholic priest from a covert action perspective is that you have an excuse to be anywhere at any time. You know, the church could go where angels fear to tread, as it were. For instance, in World War II, Vatican's gardens, there were apartments there that abutted each other, so you could go from one apartment to another in the middle of the night if you were a British diplomat and if you were the Pope's right-hand man. You could meet very easily and pass information it would get from Rome to London later that night. After the war began, uh, the Vatican tried to stay neutral, but... Then uh, Hitler uh, invaded Poland, and he, uh, well, 
was killing a lot of Jews and rounding up Jews, but also killed a lot of Catholics, and that disturbed the Vatican? It did. And in fact, the first accusations of silence against Pius XII were not mounted by Jews, but really by Polish Catholics who felt betrayed because there was this butchery of the Polish clergy, which was going on by the SS in October 1939. And the Vatican did not explicitly denounce it. And so the, the Poles felt very betrayed. But at just the time that all this was coming into the Vatican, this in- intelligence about these massacres of Polish priests, the Pope received an overture from the German resistance to Hitler and the military <coughs> and really gave him a chance to weigh in and decide whether he was going to go all out and try and help remove Hitler or whether he was going to simply wait out these massacres. What, who was Joseph Muller, and what was his role in helping Pope uh, Pius XII gather intelligence? Joseph Muller was the ace of papal spies in Germany, according to the SS documents, which have been declassified. He was the best agent of the Val- Vatican intelligence system in Germany. He really was quite an interesting figure. He would smuggle secrets over the Alps in a single-seat sports plane, flying them from Munich to Murano. And they would then be carried, these secrets, down the mainland of Italy into the Vatican, where they were put up on the top shelf of the Pope's library in a red book that was carved out on the inside. Mueller himself was a very adroit figure, very crafty. He was almost the Odysseus of the German resistance, if you will, a kind of salesman for the German forces which were trying to remove Hitler. So he's collecting a lot of information. Then there's the whole matter of evaluating it. Was, uh, was there a group in place that could do that? There was. The the Pope has a Secretariat of State, but these secret actions to remove Hitler were done independently of that. So I would compare it to, if you remember what Reagan did in Iran-Contra, where he ran a kind of secret war out of the back door of the White House. This was akin to that. The Pope had Jesuit advisors, German Jesuit advisors in Rome, who, through these secret, sacred social networks, had maintained contact with Josef Mueller, who worked for Cardinal Fahaber in Munich. And so these people all knew each other from before the war. The Pope had, in fact, ridden horses with some of the German generals who were beginning to try to get rid of Hitler. They trusted each other, and they worked through these informal contacts. One of the reports from Mueller was particularly upsetting to Pacelli. It was of a special school for Hitler's uh, new elite race. What upset him about that? Well, at the Order Castle at Sonthofen, which was a kind of SS finishing school, if you if you will, Hitler had come in 1937 to officially cut the ribbon there and initiate these SS youth to become the new uh, racial elite of Germany. And he said there, I am going to crush the Catholic Church under my foot like a toad. And this report was then um, carried to the Vatican by a stricken young cadet who was of Catholic background and began to have a crisis of conscience. And because the SS had succeeded in penetrating the Catholic courier system to a degree at that point, this cadet was soused out by the SS and was he and a friend were thrown from an express train and killed. And this report was very determinant in Pacelli seeing that the Nazis meant business and really did mean to destroy the church. Mark Riebling has specialized in writing on secret intelligence. Uh, His latest book, Church of Spies, The Pope's Secret War Against Hitler, is published by Basic Books. There were several plots uh, to murder Hitler, uh, including a few from the Vatican, and uh, Mueller was involved in them. Can you tell us about the one in 1942? Well, there was one that spread from basically 1942 to 43, which culminated in an attempt to kill Hitler by placing a bomb on his plane. Unfortunately, the fuse froze in the plane when it climbed to avoid flak, and so the plane landed and Hitler was was safe. But the Vatican was deeply involved in this in in a number of ways. First, they were negotiating peace terms with the West um, uh, to try to make sure that there would be an orderly transition of power in Germany And this was really sort of, in a way, the beginning of the Cold War because Stalin found out about this and was not happy that, despite assurances, the Western powers were considering doing a separate peace with post-Hitler Germany. And the Vatican was was deeply involved in this and, of course, wanted an anti-communist post-war order. But within that, there were very granular things that the German Jesuits did. For instance, they obtained the blueprints to one of Hitler's homes, one of his bunkers, 
because the sewage from a, a Jesuit college in Munich was leaking into the SS barracks, and then there was a lawsuit over this, and in the process, the Jesuits obtained the blueprints and passed them on to Hitler's would-be killers. Now, there were also, uh, after the war, there were a number of Catholic groups that helped smuggle uh, former Nazis out of Europe and into South America. Was the Catholic Church split even within the Vatican? Well, the rat lines uh, controversy, as it were, is a very interesting historical problem. I think the important thing to remember about the rat lines, which were these underground railroads, essentially, that were used to smuggle people in and out of Europe, they began as a British intelligence operation to get downed Allied pilots out during the war, and they were also used by Hitler's opponents to smuggle Jews out. And then at the end of the war, these same monasteries, convents, rectories were used by people in the German military to get themselves out, to get their family out. Hitler was obsessed with finding secret agents that would lead back to the Pope because he regarded the Vatican as the greatest center of espionage in the world. Uh, and, and he came close in Prague. What happened there? Well, in Prague, the Jesuit underground was very deeply involved, and this is one of the findings of Church of Spies, in the assassination, the successful assassination of Reinhard Heydrich, who was the SS spy chief and the architect of the Final Solution. He was gunned down at a hairpin turn in May 1942 by Czech guerrillas who had been trained by British intelligence. But the whole support system, as we see even today with terrorist acts, there's a large support system of people who aid and abet. And one of the things a church could do, because it was positioned, embedded, as it were, in a every society in Europe, was it could provide shelter. So, for instance, in this case, after this top Nazi was gunned down, the people who did it went to ground in the cathedral in Prague, and there was a very dramatic uh, shootout there where you had machine guns in place in the choir loft, and down in the crypt you had a, a gun battle. It was really cinematic stuff, and Hitler was so upset by the role that the church had played in aiding the, these assassins that this was very determinate, according to the records, in making him feel that he was going to abolish the church entirely after the war. And then when Mussolini fell, Hitler vowed to invade the Vatican, uh, but he didn't because his advisors didn't think it was a good idea? Yes, Goebbels, who was his propaganda minister, and von Ribbentrop, who was his foreign minister, Hitler's foreign minister, they were very much against this because of the effect they believed it would have on public opinion. Already by, this is the second half of 1943, the Germans realized that, that they were going to lose the war. Hitler probably didn't admit it to himself, but his more shrewd advisors were already jockeying to try and get decent terms from the West. Had the Pope or the Vatican played any role in the downfall of Mussolini? The Pope personally played a very, very deep role. The Vatican, more generally as a political institution, no, because there were many there who were sympathetic to Mussolini. But the Pope himself was in touch with President Roosevelt in the United States by secret radio link, and this was very helpful to the Allies intriguing to remove Mussolini. How aware was the Vatican of the final solution? Reports and knowledge are not the same thing. I think there was a worldwide refusal to acknowledge what the evidence said, and there was a kind of dismissal of these atrocity reports. But certainly by the middle of 1942, the Pope had to admit that a wholesale slaughter was underway. And we, we know from the eyewitness testimony that he did write out a protest, and he planned to issue it. This was in July 1942. But after the Dutch bishops had issued a protest and the Nazis responded by shipping off tens of thousands of Catholics to the concentration camps, as well as stepping up their deportation of Jews in Holland, the Pope decided that it would have just the reverse effect. And although he came close in Christmas 1942, using a term which meant race and denouncing the persecution of people according to race, he, he refrained from explicitly denouncing the, these crimes. In France, um, the most of the help to save Jews... Uh, was done by Protestants, by the, the Huguenots, not by the, the Catholic Church. Was the Church involved in any way in helping Jews escape? Well, the, the reports to um, President Roosevelt through his um, spy system, his spy service OSS, say somewhat the contrary of what you just said. They say, in fact, that the most determined resistance to um, Hitler in the occupied territories as well as within Germany itself was mounted by Catholics. And these reports came not from Catholic sources, but from socialists and, and Protestants. And so there were, there were people there who were definitely in, 
sort of tacitly approving of anti-Semitism. There's no question, and particularly the French Episcopate did not show particular courage. But you did have, especially the orders, the Dominicans, the Benedictines, the Jesuits, who, who did, did more than nothing. The beatification of Pope Pius XII is stalled. Do you hope that your book will give greater clarification about his role in trying to stop Hitler? Well, I'd, I'd like to not get too involved in that because, first of all, I'm not a believing Catholic, and I would not presume to tell the, the Church what it should do. From a tactical point of view, I think it would be a debacle in terms of much improved Catholic relations with Jews. I think that the sainting pious will, would it not be something that would be well accepted and well understood by um, world Jewry at this point in time. Even though this book sort of gives us a different picture of the Pope. Well, it does. And I think, look, even the Pope's critics have all admitted in a sentence or a paragraph um, that he conspired to remove Hitler, but they've shown sort of little curiosity about this. This shows that he was not Hitler's Pope, but at the same time, I think you have to be careful and say it doesn't follow that he was Anne Frank's Pope. Now, I know that you're uh, promoting this book. That's what you're doing mostly. But from 2002 to 2006, you served as research director for the Center for Policing Terrorism, which partnered with uh, then LAPD Chief William Bratton to create and administer the National Counterterrorism Academy. Are you doing any work with Commissioner Bratton today as we face the possibility of more attacks? Uh, New York will be one of the obvious targets, although I think ISIS has said Washington is next. Well, not formally. You know, I'm still friends with all the good people I worked with at that time. I, I am concerned, um, based on what I learned and saw when I was working with the NYPD and other government agencies, and what I'm most concerned about is the failure of the West to come up with a compelling story or counter-narrative that says um, compelling to disaffected Muslim youth in Europe as the ISIS narrative is and, and their iconography. And so, for instance, you have more British um, youth joining ISIS than are joining up in the British military. And so there's a kind of vacuum in the West that we think will our democracy and coming to our society and economic well-being is powerful enough to attract people to our way of life, but it's, it's just not. These people, they're playing soccer in the dust in some housing project in Basra, and once they join ISIS, you know, they have a story that it's like they're living in the Iliad, and it's, their life is numinous all of a sudden. And the human desire for meaning at a deep level is something that I think is, we have to struggle with because in a lot of ways we've kind of separated ourselves from, from these narratives. Do you think that uh, the suggestions by many politicians and others that all of Islam is somehow implicated in this, uh, w really uh, pushes some of those kids into more radical behavior? I don't. Are they, are they feeling like they are being targeted? Well, I certainly, I know that they feel that they're targeted, but I, I don't think it's because Islam is being called out by some, like um, my good friend Sam Harris, who I think is largely correct in his diagnosis that there is a, an issue with Islam and political Islam, um, but we have certain politicians saying that we don't want to have any refugees from the Middle East coming into this country, or in the case of Jeb Bush, only Christian refugees. I, I'm personally less concerned about that than with the fact that their their narrative in, is structured such that really any kind of limitations on what they see as political Islam justifies a death sentence on those who impede it. So, for instance, you see in France, they're, they're, they're citing the fact that you know there are laws against wearing burqas as really one of the motivating factors in attacking. And so if you have liberal societies which feel that you can't have even a nativity scene in the town square, and as an extension of that kind of liberal secular worldview, they're going to prevent certain Islamic practices, you've got a real problem. And I think we, we have to, yet to negotiate that. And Jews can't wear yarmulkes to school either. Uh, they do apply it uh, evenly, uh, so one group cannot say, well, we're being picked on. Well, uh, within that, though, there are, for instance, communities here in New York State where people who are Orthodox Jews or, again, the Amish can live according to their ways. And I think certainly we'd have to go a long way to accommodate some of the demands of people who want to live according to the Quran within our liberal society. But it's one of the things we have to look at. Have we gone really to the ninth and tenth mile as we have in accommodating some other religious groups here in the West? Getting back to your book, you, you have seen some of the documents for the first time. Nobody else has reported on them. Um, do you think that uh, uh, what has been the response so far? Have people been surprised by what you've discovered? 
Well, certainly, I have to say that Catholics have been sort of a little, in my view, euphoric and maybe a little bit too self-congratulatory because this pope has been so beaten on and Catholics have been so beaten on for so many years that I think finally they say, wow, we don't have to feel completely guilty about all this. And my concern is that because this is a kind of feel-good story for Catholics, that they're going to miss the opportunity for self-reflection, which I believe it's very important that it, that it does continue here. Because the church was not totally exemplary in its behavior. That's it, right. It, it was better than we have heard, but uh, it perhaps could have done more? Indeed, and I think that, look, there was a something that was said during the Cold War by one of the CIA officers who was in charge of getting rid of Fidel Castro for the Kennedy brothers, and he said, assassination is always a confession of weakness because it's showing you can't deal with the problem by some other way. And I think for Pius XII, truly, this was a confession of weakness on the part of the church, that Pius XII felt that if he spoke out, that European Catholics were so compromised through anti-Semitism, they would not have listened to him, so he felt that he had to act secretly. Mark Raibling's book is Church of Spies, the Pope's Secret War Against Hitler. It is published by Basic Books. Thank you so much for being on our show today. An honor and a pleasure. Thank you.